violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Hello, everyone. Nice to be back here for another cello chat. Thanks for uh, joining me today. Uh, first of all, I'd um, like to thank Paul Katz and um, the staff of uh, Cello Bello, uh, including Isaac, who's helping as the host today, uh, thanking them for making these cello chats possible and for all the other great cello things that they do, that they sponsor on the website. It's really a great service to the cello community and to the larger uh, community beyond it. Uh, so in the past, I did some sessions here on cello bello on practicing, uh, how to practice efficiently and effectively, and a couple of cello chats about pedagogy, uh, including a session about my Foyer blog and the warm-up blogs. Uh, if you haven't seen the, that, that series of blogs that came out weekly on cello bello in 2018, uh, maybe Isaac can put up a link in the chat room. Uh, today, I want to talk about cello wellness and healthy playing and especially good habits that can set us up for being able to play for our entire lives. Uh, I'm going to use a PowerPoint uh, to highlight some of the things because there's a lot of information and um, if you want you can get the PowerPoint at the end. I'll be happy to send it to you. You can just uh, email me uh, at my email address. Um, so I am going to set up the um, PowerPoint here. And hopefully you can see that. Um, so I'm calling this session today Kinesthetics and Calisthenics for Cellists. And we're going to talk about good body usage in playing the cello uh, with the goal that we can play for our entire lives, uh, like uh, Greenhouse did and Casals well into their, into their 90s. Uh, so the three biggest causes of injury uh, for musicians are misuse, overuse, and, and accidents. And I'm going to spend a lot of time today on the first of these, on, on misuse, um, or conversely on good use, the things that we can do to avoid injury by using our bodies in the best possible way. Things like balance, uh, relaxation, ballistics, and even more basic, just knowing how the joints and the muscles work efficiently and effectively. I think a lot of cellists are not really aware of the physicality of playing. Uh, and especially when they first start learning to play or if they learn something uh, wrong, to relearn how to play. So they get a lot of bad habits uh, right from the start. And cello playing, as I often say, is, is an athletic activity. We need to treat our bodies like athletes. We're small muscle athletes, but nevertheless, we're athletes. Uh, so I want to mention a little bit about overuse, which can also be a major cause of injury. Uh, we have to be really careful about overusing our body, which is different from misusing it. Uh, when I did my doctorate work uh, with Greenhouse, uh, I was playing all of the big literature in thumb position for the whole time. I was playing uh, the Sixth Suite, Bach Sixth Suite, the Shostakovich uh, Concerto, the Sinfonia of Concertante, Prokofiev, and so forth. And I did my entire doctorate in one year, including five different recitals with different programs. Um, by the time I was done, I had developed a, 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 com, a kind of pain in my shoulder, not from misuse so much as just from overuse, because I was constantly working uh, up there in thumb position. So my solution uh, was um, <laughs> to stop doing so much thumb position work and then to do some acupuncture, which actually re really helped the, solve the problem, and I never had the problem again. But the real solution uh, for preventing overuse is to take lots of breaks in practicing and to limit just repetition, the same thing over and over again. And the other thing is not to do dramatic increases in the amount of time that we're playing. Um, so uh, you have to be very careful if you put the cello down for a little bit when you come back to it again, that you go little by little. I had a student uh, who was a senior, so she at the end of her junior year at USC, and she was a music education major, and she was doing the La Lo Concerto, and she um, had prepared the entire concerto right before the summer. She was going to work during the summer on uh, getting it all better and playing it through and so forth. But unfortunately, she put the cello down for the summer, and she came back a week or two before school started in the fall, her senior year, 
And uh, she just bang started right in on the Lalo Concerto and playing and big stuff. And she was not a large woman, uh, and she has rather thin bone and, and so forth, but had never had any in, any kind of problems or injuries or anything. And she just caused uh, a major problem for herself with tendonitis because she just plunged right in without sort of slowly warming up and getting back into playing after not having played for several weeks or months even. Um, so she unfortunately wasn't able to do her senior recital. She was a music education major, so she was still able to graduate without doing the recital. But being a very determined person, she so she was out for about a year uh, dealing with tendonitis and recovery and so forth. But being a very determined person, she came back after um, that year. She started her master's then the next year and um, decided she wanted to do the Lalo Concerto and play it, the entire concerto for her recital, which she did and did a fantastic job. But she learned a lot about you can't just plunge into playing. You need to go slowly. So one of the things I'm going to talk about today a little bit is how one goes slowly into back into uh, playing. Uh, so the third thing I want to mention is um, accident related injuries. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately because uh, of a recent non cello playing accident that I had, which definitely uh, affected my cello playing. Uh, so in July, um, I was in Toronto in our condo and the day before leaving for a music festival in Germany, uh, I came out of the shower and I slipped and I hydroplaned backwards, fell on my shoulder and just lay there because I was in shock. I was in pain. I knew I had done some, some damage, uh, but I didn't know exactly what, what. And I, the next day, left and went to Germany. I couldn't, I couldn't get out uh, past about the middle of the bow on the C and the G string and not at all on the A string, lifting the shoulder. I wasn't able to do my recitals there at the festival, which is the first time in my entire career that I had to cancel any concerts. Uh, and um, I was able Excuse me, I was able to do my teaching and uh, uh, coaching and so forth. And eventually I came back and uh, had an MRI and found that I had what they called a massive tear. Uh, and I thought the word massive was an adjective, but actually it's the way the doctors refer to uh, a major injury. What I had is torn completely off, torn two tendons, two of the three tendons that are in the shoulder. And... Uh, uh, had uh, ripped uh, muscle also, so I, it was it was a pretty severe uh, injury, and I uh, came back here and had the surgery, and uh, then started PT, and I'm in recovery mode now, but am able to play again. Um, just recently, I started being able to play my my daily box suites, which I do, um, and I'm able to play for 20-25 minutes with repeats the box suites. Uh, and I'm doing my PT religiously every day. I have about 26 different exercises that I do in various kinds of things for uh, recovering. And I'm, I'm treating it really seriously and I'm going to my PT twice a week. And uh, the doctor said last week, two weeks ago, he said that I'm, I'm ahead of schedule in recovery. And in fact, I'm able to play now completely out to the tip. Can't play yet two hours long which is my goal to be able to then be able to do full rehearsals and so forth. Uh, but I am increasing it little by little. And so I'm, you know, on the, on the mend and very fortunate about that. So these kind of accidents can happen. Um, I've been fortunate in my 50 year career of having nothing else major uh, go wrong, but it was very frustrating not to be able to play for some seven months or so. And now only a little bit at a time. But today in the session here, I want to focus especially on using our bodies well in practicing and playing um, and uh, the concept of misuse and how we can use our bodies better. And I'm really conscious of this nowadays because I am revisiting some fundamental technique after not having played for, for several months. Um, so I'm calling this session, as I said, uh, kinesthetics and calisthenics. And uh, we want to focus then on uh, things that we can do to help ourselves physically so we can play for life. Um, so before we get into it, really, I just want to mention some basic principles involved with this. Uh, first of all, body alignment, making sure that you're sitting well, uh, that you have, um, that you're aligned, head aligned and so forth, uh, right height chair, a lot of people playing on too low chairs, um, uh, making sure that your feet are able to be straight down, uh, the legs straight, 
the kinds of things that one learns, of course, in Alexander Technique, if, if you've had any of that experience, just making sure you're really nicely aligned. Another basic principle is no kinks. I call it a kink something that's a bend in the arm or in the shoulder, in the wrist, or in the fingers, whatever, that, you're, that there's a, a funny kind of angle going on that's just not aligned again uh, in the right way. And that becomes really important. No kinks, because if you have a kink, that's where the tendons are going around a corner and they'll fray. So if you think of a well uh, that has a bucket and it has a, a, a string, a, a rope here that goes around a gear, and you're pulling up this bucket, the rope is going to fray where the gear was. Um, that's the place where the friction is. And the same thing if your hand is bent like this, for example, and it shouldn't be doing that, uh, and you keep doing the same thing, it'll the tendons going around that kink, uh, around that, that joint, are eventually going to fray, and that, of course, is tendonitis then. Next uh, thing, no muscles fighting muscles. Um, for example, one of the, the biggest causes of tension is uh, on the left hand is the thumb squeezing, pushing up against the fingers, pushing down. So a muscle is fighting a muscle in that way. Or when you shift, that you're aligned well and not fighting with certain muscles that are going in the wrong direction, kind of, that you're relaxed as much as possible. Lots of examples of that uh, in causing tension. Muscles fighting muscles, we don't want that. Um, and a basic rule, if you can move a body part, uh, the muscle is more relaxed. So lots of the kinds of um, stretching exercises and the uh, warm-up exercises deal with just being able to move the muscles in a, a good way. And one final thing then, um, sort of mind over matter in this. I think a lot of our practicing is actually practicing not so much just even for the physicality of playing, but the mind controlling the physicality of the playing. And so there's a lot of sort of silent practice that one can do or practice even away from the cello. Um, so uh, miming, for example, I, I, I like to think of uh, uh, just miming a motion. For example, miming a shift, making sure that I'm shifting from the elbow and you can do this away from the cello or vibrato. You can do this on the arm, whatever. You can practice those kinds of things away from the body. I uh, have often uh, liked to use uh, <laughs> a noodle like this with my students to practice all kinds of things like shifting again, that you're shifting from the elbow and then, then you move. Or the vibrato again, that it feels nice and soft on the noodles, so it's a nice feeling to be able to practice vibrato and all kinds of exercises in that way. Or even for the bow, uh, practicing, for, let's say, for the little finger, uh, being able to use it as a balance kind of thing is, uh, is, is a good thing. So these are kind of, again, mind over matter. It's not actually playing the cello, but actually you can, uh, you know, you don't play out of tune if you make this shift C to C. You don't play out of tune, but if you know proprioception wise, if you know where you are, um, then, um, oh, my wife is asking, can you see me bigger? Uh, but I need to and actually use the smaller. PowerPoint. Yeah, okay. that's, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, as I was saying, the, um, uh, you can, if you know proprioception wise, where your elbow is supposed to be for that C, and I know it's about there, or I know fourth position's about here, or first position here, um, then uh, you can actually, you know, you're not playing out of tune, <laughs> but you kind of know it's a good way to practice, just practicing uh, uh, in that way, miming or using a noodle or something like that. So being a great musician means a lot of different things. Um, it obviously means having a good sense of sound, uh, good intonation, good musicality, but it's also the physicality of playing. And so today what I was going to focus on is... Um, this uh, sort of list of things that are all dealing in various ways with the physicality of playing. Um, the stretches, I'll spend just a little bit of time on stretches, warm-ups, uh, figuring out balance, uh, strength, coordination, flexibility, efficiency, endurance, speed, agility, relaxation. I don't know if we'll get to everything in this hour, but uh, we'll, we'll go as far as we, as far as we can. Um, so I'm gonna start with stretches. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, talking about this because I do have this whole warm-up blog on stretches um, that uh, you can probably see in the in the chat there. Hopefully, that's uh, that's in there. Um, stretches are really important before and after our 
practicing or playing uh, because what it does besides warming up the body it actually helps to rid the body of acid that builds up so when you do exercise one of the reasons you in running you stretch before you run Oh, and after you run, we're advised to stretch after running, uh, is because by stretching, you're actually getting rid of some of that acid that builds up in the joints. So a couple of stretches that I like, i um, just gonna mention a couple really quickly, and you can do some of these with me if you want. Uh, what I call the under the chair stretch, which is just going under like this. Hopefully you can see going under like this and uh, letting your arms kind of go very freely like this, like an elephant trunk or something. That's great for the lower back, for the shoulders, for just warming up the whole body. Uh, another one is shoulder shrugs, this kind of thing. And what you do forward, you want to do backwards. I've been doing a lot of these shoulder shrugs because it's involved in my recovery. It's one of the PT exercises. Um, another one is neck rolls, this kind of thing. Again, slowly, of course, I'm doing it way too fast now, and you might want to even associate it with breathing, which we'll talk about afterwards, um, that you breathe in on half the roll or out uh, on half the roll. Uh, those kind of things are really, really good to, um, to do for warming up the body, and even while you're playing a scale. Um, arms across the body, this is another PT exercise I'm doing a lot of uh, because it's involved with the tendons and the muscles that were torn there. Um, the anton tendonitis stretch is one of my favorite ones um, because it really can help with dealing with these tendons here and preventing uh, major injury um, in that way. So what it is is you put your hands together, you go down, count about five seconds, come back up, and then shake it out and always do shake out at the end of these things. So doing that a couple of times, that really stretches here. You don't want to feel pain and it's all of these exercises, no pain, no gain is not part of what we're doing. So you don't want pain, you just go as far as you can going down, come back up and shake it out. And the opposite one is actually also a really useful one, just going in the opposite direction, again, stretching out in that way. A um, Couple other ones, finger rubs, just rubbing the joints here. Uh, I used to play with a violinist, Jerry Luchtenberg, uh, who would, before concerts, always do this kind of a little uh, rubbing kind of thing of all the joints of the fingers. She felt that it helped her a lot with her vibrato and the flexibility there. And uh, waving bye-bye is another one. I mean, there are tons of these things and I'm just mentioning a few. You can see more on my uh, my warm-up blog there on Cello Bello or on my website. Uh, these are really good. Obviously, we need this for the bow arm, uh, for that kind of emotion. We need this as part of our vibrato. So waving bye-bye, waving bye-bye side to side. That's always uh, great. So uh, next, uh, I want to talk about some exercises um, for warming up after the initial stretch. And I spend about maybe five or 10 minutes in my practice time uh, doing some various warm-ups. And there are just, there are just tons of these uh, different kinds of warm-ups. I'm just going to show a few here today of my favorites. Um, and we'll start with um, this one here, which I like a lot, which is um, just warming up again the whole body, more or less the uh, the string crossing. <laughs> starting starting on the top and so forth all different kinds of things you can also do it up here and starting up bow and all kinds of variations of that um, uh, by the way, just uh, the, when I first take the cello up in the morning, I'll, I'll do things like I just have my own little sequence of things. And so forth. Just um, some little little exercises that I feel good about. It's almost uh, day, just a daily. I don't even think about it. I just sort of go to those kind of little warm-up things that help me feel feel good about uh, about playing. Another one is um, this uh, independent um, finger kind of exercise. Um, so uh, just uh, alternating one and two. 
two, three. Three, four, and so forth. The nice thing about this is that you do the down bow on one direction with one, one, two, one, two, and then on the up bow it reverses itself. Then, and you can be thinking about the thumb not squeezing, as I mentioned before, or not pushing down, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, another one similar related is um, comes from Radu Aldulescu, a great Romanian cellist. Uh, I studied with him a little bit in Freiburg, um, and and he had this kind of a warm up exercise. Mm -hmm. So that would be one, two, three, four, and on the bottom there you can see all the combinations of the fingers. So like one, two, four, three. And you get all the combinations of the fingers and of course on different strings also. Uh, I find that to be a very useful, nice uh, kind of a warm up. I like usually doing some sort of a cadence exercise uh, in the morning, just kind of feeling how double stops work. And then going up. So going in each of the positions, in neck position, uh, and then also coming down the same, same way. Uh, the second one there on the right side. And again, just going up the cello. Of course, working out things, I'm just doing this very fast now, but uh, taking a little bit of time working out uh, the twist motion, working out intonation, working out contact point issues, all those kinds of things. Um, another one is um, a little bit longer sequence um, uh, that deals with extensions then. So... <laughs> You know, I probably want to stop and check along the way to make sure that I'm, I'm in tune and so forth right now. I'm just going through it. Uh, if anybody's interested in these and if you're not familiar with them, I'll be glad to send you the PowerPoint, as I said, at the end. Um, the Foyer daily exercise. The Foyer is uh, our cello Bible, I think, uh, because uh, that one book has uh, so many different kinds of exercises and they're great for warming up. If I haven't played the cello for a couple of days or something under normal circumstances, um, I would probably start in with one of these early uh, pages of the foyer uh, because they're just really good little exercises for the finger, for sound, for intonation, for all, all those kinds of things. And now that I'm recovering, and this is where I started again, uh, just doing some of these. <laughs> You can do it for uh, vibrato. Um, speak up. Okay, my wife is telling me to speak up. Uh, okay, when I get my head down. Um, so this number three here is another good sort of warm up, and it's dealing with the various positions, uh, shifting between first and third, and first and second, and so forth. So. Um, <laughs> slowly for uh, just vibrato. Feeling balance and um, doing it uh, again for intonation, doing it for contact point issues, um, shifting of course. So this goes on for several pages of uh, shifting between different positions and it's very very useful. Um, another one is the um, Related to the foyer, I'm um, not sure if people in this country are familiar with Bill um and his exercises for left hand are really useful, um, uh, for, similar to the foyer, but dealing with the upper part of the cello. So, um, It's 
so forth, right? Um, uh, I was doing this yesterday with one of my students because she was working on the Boccherini, a major sonata, and uh, there's a passage. <laughs> similar of course the uh, this Vilkomirsky is in uh, uh, E major and the Boccherini is in A major so I had her actually do the Vilkomirsky in uh, that little exercise in uh, in A major uh, so without a D sharp and uh, it's very useful doing this on all strings and doing these exercises in different keys just by uh, changing the accidentals and so forth um, of course there's the Kosman most people are familiar with number one <laughs> And you can do all kinds of variations on that. So, you know, you want to make life interesting for yourself. Um, so things uh, like a, just a detaché stroke. Or a spiccato stroke or, uh, you know, just uh, changing it from day to day. Um, there's also a variation on this, which is very useful, which is going um, two, four, three, four at the end. So. And that's a little harder, two, four, three, four, uh, but it just adds one more uh, interesting complexity to that. The other one, the one on the right side of the page there, is less well known. It's also another Kosman uh, exercise that does the same kind of thing, but it goes across two strings. And... And so forth. And it goes down and then it comes back up. Um, and that's a very, it's a nice one. I actually like that one better, even though I didn't play as well. I like that one better than the number one, the, the usual one. Um, and more warm-up kind of things, um, these Boeing variations in Foyer again. Again, uh, Foyer is uh, our Bible. And the uh, number 32, the big number 32 through number 36 Boeing variations. You'll find I, uh, that was the Foyer blog that I did uh, a few years ago on Cello Bello. Um, it's on my website. You can see it there. And uh, that's a very useful, it's again one of these things that I go back to now. I just go through very slowly, of course, much slower than that, and do the variations. It's great for my bow arm, which is where uh, I had the, the injury. Uh, and then um, I like to do various kinds of improvisation things for myself as part of a warm-up. Um, obviously not all of these every day and mix them up, uh, do different ones on different days, but just uh, taking a key, taking a, uh, uh, a rhythm, uh, taking a meter, uh, taking a sound concept and just making a little improvisation. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be just in first position or it can just go up one string. Uh, does, it's not for, for that. All of these warm-ups really are about taking us out of the outside world and bringing us down into something uh, that's our in our studio, our calm practice room, a whole other world. And part of the thing with the warm-ups is not just warming up physically, but also mentally, just taking us from the complicated outside world into our cello world. Um, and so another one of, uh, I think this is the last one that I'll show of these warm-ups um, examples, is this little lullaby. So when I was a, a tiny baby, my grandmother um, would wheel me in a, in a in a baby carriage, and and sing a lullaby. And she made up this little lullaby, and all of her other grandchildren. She made up other lullabies for them. As a musician, I just remembered this my entire life, and so I often will go back and just uh, that's my way again of coming out from the outside world and. <laughs> Thank you.
this in different keys and on different parts of the cello. Um, and do it sometimes on just one string. And uh, it's a nice way for me, again, to be able to just kind of focus in on playing the cello. So um, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is about um, scales. <laughs> Um, as I don't consider them warm ups actually. Well, there are a couple of scales that I consider warm ups, just things like uh, a little chromatic scale. <laughs> I do that on all the different strings. Also, another one of my just sort of daily or every other day kind of little warm-ups. And the nice thing about a chromatic scale like that, one octave and one string, is you can do in different groupings. You can do two. it works out very well to divide it up in those ways sort of like the Galamian scales um, and I do that on different strings and um, do the same thing with the upper octave or do I don't really even consider that practicing scales. It's just more of a, a warm-up. But then scales themselves are really, really important. And um, those of you who know me know that I put a lot of uh, emphasis on it because when you're practicing scales, you can also be practicing for balance, uh, relaxation, flexibility, all the things that I'm about to talk about uh, because you can um, apply it to the scales, which should be pretty, you know, um, you know your scales really <laughs> really well if you're doing it on a daily basis and you can focus on all kinds of other uh, issues. Um, so I, uh, as part of my, uh, the things I've been doing over the last year when I couldn't play uh, the cello over the last seven months or so, is I'm writing a scale book um, that is going to be published in um, by the end of this year, probably by Mel Bay, uh, working on it, writing it with uh, a former student of mine, Teddy Buchholz, who is now professor of cello at the University of Arizona. And we're having a great time putting this together. Uh, we have it mostly, mostly written already. Um, and one of the interesting things about this book is going to be it's going to be a comprehensive sequential kind of approach to scales. So starting with the very basic one octave scales that Suzuki students might be learning um, and going increasingly complex kinds of things, intermediate scales, and then all the way through the most advanced kinds of scales uh, and uh, scales in sixths and thirds and octaves and uh, modal scales and octatonic scales and all different kinds of uh, other uh, scales. So it's, it's about 140 pages or so. Uh, and uh, as I said, it'll be published hopefully by the end of the year. One of the interesting things that we're doing with this as well, well, I thought I'll just give you a sneak peek preview here uh, of so this is the table of contents. Um, you can see the beginning scales there, and then we spent, have a, a big chapter there on um, some technical information, and we're going to have videos with that uh, how to how to go about thinking about various aspects of scales, um, the intermediate scales, pre foyer scales, uh, and uh, in part I'm doing this book because uh, I'm inspired by my granddaughter who is uh, yeah, Suzuki. Uh, cello cellist, a young uh, young girl, and uh, she we were working together on the pre pre foyer uh, uh, two octave scales without the complexity of the seven different arpeggios that go with it. But then comes after that two octave foyer chapter six. You can see two octave foyer scales and arpeggios, the ones that are in the foyer book there, which are great. Um, then some advanced scales, and uh, you can see then scales and double stops, and all different variety of different kinds of scales. Um, and one of the things that's going to be really uh, unique about this book is we're going to have um, drones that go along with it. Um, so uh, another former student of mine, uh, Ryan Knott, is creating a whole bunch of drone uh, kinds of things, either tonic drones or chordal drones or even jazz drones that go with it. I thought I would demonstrate a little bit if I can here. We'll see if this works. 
So this would be an example of C major scale. string kinds of strokes. So forth. And it goes to triplets. And, and then sixteenth notes. Sextuplets. Brexit. Spiccato. So forth. And then it goes even to octuplets. Octuplets next. And then there's a whole set of. set of arpeggios based on the Foyer arpeggio system. seven of those um, arpeggios. So the point of this, of course, is having these drones working on intonation, um, being able to listen to and adjust. And by the way, the sounds in this are, those are not electronic sounds, those are actual orchestral uh, string sounds. And uh, so Ryan has done a great job and we're in the process of putting all of that together. So next thing I wanna talk about now is balance. I think balance is one of these really important things for um, being able to play in a relaxed manner and an easy manner. And um, we need to be balanced with our shoulders, balanced with the arm, balanced with the head, and so forth and so on. Uh, and one of the important things for balance for me is what I call left-right motion or contrary motion, where you're actually going, moving in the opposite direction from the bow. The point is that you're balanced, not to this middle of the cello here, but a little bit over to the side here. So when you're on the right side, you're balanced here, and when you go to the left side and your bow is out there, you're still balanced. Your arm is out there, you're balanced over here. And so you get this nice kind of balance. And one of the things it does is helps make a better sound, an easier, better sound in this part of the bow. So when you're drawing the bow, instead of pushing as you get up in the upper part of the bow, you're able to pull the bow and use balance to, to get it. And this, by the way, I realized again after the injury that I had with my shoulder, how important this balance kind of thing is. Uh, because I wasn't, as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't able to get much past about here on the bow. And uh, with the balancing, I'm, it's almost as if my arm is elongating by now moving to the left. I can 
actually go further. If I didn't move to the left, I would have to actually move my arm out further. And this balance thing really helps, helped me a lot with uh, the recovery of the shoulder. So um, when you're practicing for left-right motion, uh, you, you want to make sure that you're really feeling the, the sway, the balance, that you go to your right side, you can lift, I don't know if you can see my foot, go to the right side, you kind of lift your one foot, and then you go to the left side and lift the other foot. So you really feel like you're balanced and centered on your pelvis and the way you want to be in, in that way. Um, so, um, and by the way, you can practice scales using this. I'm not going to take more time on it, but it's a, a really important contrary motion. Left right motion, I think, is a really important concept for uh, playing easily. Uh, another balance thing is the little finger. So the function of the little finger for me um, is this kind of a balance thing where you're able to control the bow with the little finger in that way. And so a lot of my bow technique comes uh, from the French technique. Uh, I studied in Europe and uh, French bow technique, I think is really very sophisticated kind of uh, technique. And um, it's just finding the balance is one, actually one of the good things you can do with this is a little exercise where you hold out the bow like this, find the balance with the little finger, and then um, just take the little finger off the bow. What most people, what'll happen if I say just put your bow out like this and uh, finger on the top and then take it, take off the little finger, you'll see this, which means that I'm squeezing now between my thumb and my middle finger. What I want to see is this. I want to see the little finger being used as that balance finger in that way. So um, that's a good little exercise for, for that. Another, um, so that's the test for not squeezing. Seesaw in the air is what I was showing here. Um, you can say you can do windshield wipers or whatever. Uh, another one is the wiggle waggle, what I call the wiggle waggle. Again, just using the balance. So you don't have to use your whole arm to get from string to string. You just use the little finger to get from string to string. And vibrato, by the way, is another. I'll speak a little bit more about some vibrato motions afterwards. But vibrato is another one of those balance things. You want to balance your hand really well. So you're not going up, down, up, down, up, down in a very nice kind of balanced way. Lots and lots of balances. Uh, the shoulders, uh, the body in general, is just um, needs to be in a balanced way to be able to play easily and again for life, hopefully. Next thing I want to talk about is efficiency. Um, so efficiency, being able to, um, to play in a way that you don't have to use extra energy and extra muscle power in playing. Um, so one of the concepts is just being aware of active and passive motions. For example, in a shift, there's an active, there's an active motion from the uh, elbow and a passive motion from... So um, you don't have to you don't have to squeeze. Obviously, um, you don't lead with the with the the fingers and the hand. You lead with the elbow, the bigger muscles, and then you release here so that you can make the little adjustments that are that are necessary. Um, another one of these active passive kind of things is when you're playing spiccato, um, uh, that you're using your upper arm and the wrist in a good way, and uh, the upper arm is the active part. The wrist is passive. <laughs> When you're doing doing a stroke like that, that you're actually this is the part that's actually, and this is just nice and and passive. You don't actually do the motion from here. It's from here and relax with the wrist. Um, another one of these is the vibrato rebound motion. Uh, so an efficient motion where you're going you're going up down up down. So it's an up motion. And the backward part of it, it's not up, down, up, down, it's up, down, up, down. So it's active, passive in that way, a rebound motion. And one of my favorite things is a bal the ballistic motions. Um, ballistic motion, a ballistic motion is when you, you're, let's say, moving your arm in this direction and you don't pull your arm back, but you let it bounce back in that way. So... Um, for example, well, uh, I like to teach it through the, the foyer number 32 again. One of the, on the bottom of the page, one of the last three of the number 32 exercises is all down bows. And what we don't want to do is pull the arm back. You want to let it bounce back. I like to do this with a full bow. So 
I'm not pulling my arm back. I'm not stopping it and pulling it. I'm like a, a boomerang, just letting it kind of bounce back like that. So when you have things like... When you have th those first two chords, you don't pull the arm back. You actually let it go out and it bounces back. And you get more resonance that way also as a result of that. Um, another example would be... Um, Paganini, that variation of the Moses variations, um, is a rebound motion rather than a pulling back kind of motion. Lots of examples of those kind of um, uh, ballistic motions, what I call ballistic motions. Uh, and then there's the ping, um, which is uh, this sound that we get left hand wise, where you have an active motion again and then the passive motion of just releasing, that's efficiently using using the left hand, not pushing and squeezing down. Um, I can say a few more things about that afterwards uh, when we talk about some more relaxation things. One of the things uh, for efficiency is that I find with, us, with a lot of students is they are not aware of how the different parts of the arm really work um, for string crossings. And uh, so I like to talk about the fact that there are these four parts of the arm, upper arm, lower arm, wrist, and fingers, and that each part of the arm has a different kind of a joint. So this one here is a ball and socket joint. I'm very familiar with that from my accident. Um, and the ball and socket joint allows you to go in any direction, up and down, and this way. The lower part of the arm, though, is a hinge joint there. So that one connects by a hinge, which means it only works in that one direction. And what I find is a lot of people try to make string crossings somehow with that joint. And what happens, I mean, even just doing that a little bit hurts me up here. Uh, I can feel it because it doesn't really want to work that way. And that's one of the major causes of tendonitis, using the arm in the wrong way like that. The wrist is an, called an articulated joint, but it's like a ball and socket joint, and it goes around and it can go, in other words, in that direction and in that direction. So it has the opportunity to go in all directions. And the fingers then are three kinds of hinge joints. One, two, three little joints there that again go up and down. Now with those, we can actually use them by um, uh, just uh, pronating a little bit. We can actually use those to make the bow go left and right. But the, in order to do that, you would go from the square position that we normally have to a little bit pronated kind of position. And when you use the fingers, in the they still work in the same way, but instead of going up and down, they're now going left and right a little bit. So those are the four parts of the arm, and they're used in different ways. So there are three parts of the arm that are used for horizontal strokes. Uh, so that would be the uh, upper arm, which can use for a detaché. You can do a detaché with the upper arm there, for example, or you can do a detaché with the lower arm, because that's the way that arm works, that part of the arm works, or the wrist. You can use those three for a detaché. Now for the string crossings, you also have three. You can use the upper arm, you can use the wrist, and you can use the fingers, depending on where you are in the bow. So the upper arm probably would be here, the wrist would probably be in the middle of the bow, use the wrist, and at the frog with the fingers. But you can actually use any of them anywhere, and it depends on the tempo and the speed. If I'm doing a wave motion that's pretty fast, it's going to be mostly with the wrist, not with the upper arm. But again, using figuring out for efficiency which part of the arm is required for what kind of a sound. So there are these four basic bowing figures that are used for, that are really, the, every string crossing is going to be some combination of these four figures. And I'll just uh, quickly take you through this. The, um, the arc is that first one. So if you have a little light, we used a laser there when, when we made this for an article I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, you, but you can see how that makes an arc as you go, and you can reverse the arc then. So I'm going this direction as opposed to that direction. Um, that's the arc. The circle. Making a circle.
circle in the same way, or an ellipse if you want, and you can reverse it, you see in the second example. Figure eight. <laughs> Finally, the wave. Depending how fast, you can use your upper arm, or you can use your wrist or your fingers, depending on the kind of sound you want and where you are on the bow. And all of our basic string crossings, the most complicated things in Shostakovich concerto or whatever you want to pick, they're all based on these four motions, combinations of these four motions. And if you start looking at the literature, you'll see, you'll, you'll see how you can figure out the most efficient way to use and which part of the bow and which part of the arm to use for that. So um, when I'm teaching this, obviously all of the stuff that we're doing today, I would never teach it in this way. I'm just presenting it now uh, and hopefully it will stimulate some thinking about things. Uh, but teaching it requires just going through very logically, very sequentially, uh, one step at a time and learning these things. So this, this all would be, I would be teaching this through um, big number 32, 33, 30, big number 34 in the FOIAR uh, at the back of the book. 34 starts two strings, 35 three strings, and 36 four strings uh, with string crossings like that. Uh, that's the foyer that I mentioned. Um, that would be probably number 34 there. I can't quite read the number. Next thing I want to talk about um, is relaxation. Uh, so tension is the enemy of string playing, obviously. And uh, there are various techniques that uh, we can explore and should explore. Um, a lot of string players, a lot of musicians uh, do yoga or Zen. Um, I did a whole series of things with biofeedback and find that very useful. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that now, but I find biofeedback uh, is a very exciting way of um, teaching us about how to reduce mus muscle tension in the body. Alexander Technique is another one. The worst um, offenders as far as relaxation, I mentioned the thumb earlier, um, pushing up or squeezing here in the bow, and the shoulders. Uh, those are the, the worst offenders that I find. I mean, there are lots of other possibilities for, uh, for tension, but those are the places where I look when I have a student who's complaining about some issue or something or is not able to, to move in a good way. I, uh, those are the places I would look first. Um, and one of the most helpful things for me is recognizing, and for my students, and I, I, I spend a lot of time talking about this, recognizing how important breathing is. Um, and, you know, when I ask people how to, how to breathe effectively for relaxation, they look at me and think, you know, I've been breathing my entire life. I know how to breathe. Uh, but actually, people don't really know how to breathe in an effective way for reducing tension. And so when I ask people to show me how they breathe, they'll go, typically, they'll go like that. And that's exactly the opposite of what one should do for relaxation breathing. What we want to do for relaxation breathing with, for this kind of thing with playing is to blow the air out. When you, blow, when you take the air in like that, whether it's through the mouth or the nose, you can hold then for you know, however long, a minute, two minutes, whatever. You can just hold that. But if you blow the air out, there is no way you can keep it blown out without taking a breath in. There's a place in the brain that enforces that, that makes you, you can hold it for a second or two, but you have to then uh, involuntarily breathe in. And so that's the place to start, is just blowing air out and then finding that intake. And um, so uh, one of the things I, um, well, a really good exercise for, for this kind of breathing relaxation is, is what's called square breathing where you blow the air out, you hold it for four seconds, you take the air in through the nose, but blow out through the mouth, in through the nose. You blow out, hold for four seconds, and then let it come in, and hold for four seconds, and then blow out. And you, it's called square breathing because each one of those things is like a, uh, like a square. And um, it's a very easy thing to do, and you go around it a couple of times, and all of a sudden, 
uh, you can just feel your body relaxing. And I used to do this square breathing when I was principal cellist of, uh, of an orchestra, and all of a sudden I had a solo, and I would get nervous for the solo a couple of measures before. So I would always, um, if I wanted to, if it was a big solo, I would want to um, figure out in the rehearsal at what point before I can do maybe two times around square breathing in whatever tempo the piece is in, and just do exactly that while I'm playing, and hold the breath and blow out the breath, especially blowing out the breath, that's the important part. And I find that my tension level was much lower when I got to the solo and I would just be able to play it in a better way. So that, it can be very, very useful. One has to practice this. It's not something that just happens right, right away, but it's like everything else. You can practice this um, with, uh, with bowing, for example. You can, I would blow the air out, take the air in on the down bow. <laughs> Square breathing for that necessarily, but taking it in and blowing it out on the up bow is the most useful way. And then all kinds of variations of that with figuring out how to naturally then be able to breathe along with playing for relaxation. Um, a lot of times people are just not really thinking about relaxation and the connection with the breathing. Um, another training thing is uh, what I call the relax exercises. Uh, so dotted rhythms are one of the hardest things for string players, playing dotted rhythms. Uh, and um, what happens is we tend to go and stop the bow and are very tight in the arm. Wind players, pianists have an easier time with this because they can release much easier. And But string players always have a hard time in orchestra, for example, or just solo playing, playing accurate dotted rhythms. So I like to do an exercise where we go, relax, relax. And as I say the word relax, and I say it rhythmically, so relax, relax, da, da, ba, da, 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 in that rhythmical way. As I'm saying the word, consciously relaxing the arm. So relax, relax. And you notice the sound gets better also. It's not, it's not that kind of squeezed uh, sound. And the second example. So this is another one that comes out of the foyer number 32, these examples. Um, so it would be relax, 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 and so forth. Um, really good exercise uh, with that. I'm going to move ahead here now because uh, I can see that we're kind of running out of time a little bit here um, and talk next about a little bit of flexibility kinds of things because um, that's an important part of being able to play um, accurately and um, be able to move well uh, for adjusting intonation and so forth. First thing is um, what I call jellyfish exercise. It's just, just a warm up. It's another warm up kind of exercise of using the fingers in this way. Um, the Vulcan <laughs> finger exercise is this one, coming from Dr. Spock there, and being able to move flexibly easily in that way. Uh, finger push-ups is another one. You can do this on the cello or you can do it on your arm. A little warm-up, but again, it's a really kind of a warm-up exercise. Uh, bow rotation uh, would be the next one for that. Um, I think of the third finger on the bow as the rotating finger, the one that can, kind of controls the rotation, which of course controls how much hair you're using. And it's just a good exercise of rotating around in this way. Another one of those, those exercises I mentioned before with the little finger. This one's really with the third finger for uh, rotation. And then some uh, wrist exercises where you make in the air, no kinks here, make a box and explore the size of that box. Go in the opposite direction with the box. Uh, do uh, make a circle, make an opposite direction with a circle, take a pencil, do a box. Also kind of warm up exercise, but this is more than warm up. This is really kind of training the, um, the arm and the hand and the wrist in this case. And then doing it with the bow, of course, first with the left hand holding, box, opposite direction box, circle, opposite direction circle. And finally doing it without the left hand, which is of course harder. And it's actually harder than even when you're doing it on the cello, because uh, this way I'm really having to support it with the little finger and figuring out how does the, how does the little finger work in this process, stretching out or bending and so forth. Um, waves 
lots of different wave kind of motions and flexibility, string crossing waves, but even just waves like this, like we were just doing with the uh, bow rotation, that kind of a wave, or even a wave on one string that creates a kind of vibrato. In fact, in the uh, Baroque era, they, they, would, they would do some vibrato sometimes on the bow. And so you, for us, what's useful is having a vibrato and then adding a little bit extra from the bow. And at the end of a note, let's say you're doing a vibrato here and you want to fade and do a little extra with the bow, that just enhances uh, the vibrato a little bit. Um, so let's see, I could go on and on. The next thing I was going to talk about is some coordination things. Well, I'll give you one coordination exercise, which I like. Um, and then we'll take some questions if there are any questions there. Um, so this is one that I learned from Marcel Severo, who was my teacher in Freiburg in Germany. Um, he would do these exercises where you would go one, one, four, and two, three like that, and just go back and forth like that. Or one, three, two, four. Actually, that's the hardest one. So we'll do, uh, what did I do? One, one, four, two, three. You can do one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, and do the same kind of thing for flexibility. And then the hard one is one, three, two, four. And I often do this in classes with my students, uh, little master classes with my uh, students, and, and, and everybody has fun kind of figuring out. At first, the first time that people do this is like, how do I possibly? coordinate that. But these kind of coordination things related to flexibility are, are really important. Um, so, um, I don't know, Isaac, is um, uh, if there are any questions there, I don't see where questions are on this. Um, yeah, so we, we can start moving to the uh, live Q&A section, uh, and I'll just kind of give you the questions as I they stop, come through I can here. stop share maybe, that'll probably help. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, if ever, anyone watching wants to ask any questions, just feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but our first question is in partnership with our friends at Together with Classical. Uh, the question is, if you had to introduce classical music to someone for the first time, how would you do it? What piece huh. would you suggest? Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, wow. For the first time. That's a, that's a hard one. I mean, um, I, I, I guess probably something like the Benjamin Britten a uh, young person's guide to the orchestra is a great way to introduce people to all of the different instruments and it's a fun piece. Um, you know, if it's cello pieces, there's uh, obviously, you know, things like the swan and uh, it's, it's lovely pieces that are that are like that. Uh, everybody loves the Bach first suite, uh, the prelude to that. Uh, so a huge question and it depends really on the background of the people, um, you know, whether they have any knowledge or interest in uh, in music. I'm constantly suggesting pieces to my own students depending on whatever they're working on um, so if they're working on a french piece i'll tell them to go listen to and then i'll mention lots of different french pieces that would evoke the kind of french sound or if they're working on spanish pieces they should go explore uh spanish rhythms and uh the the kind of cadences andalusian cadences um and that sort of thing so it's a tough question to answer in a very general way if you have a more specific part of that question i'd be glad to try to adjust that. Awesome. And uh, Angela asks, any suggestions for maintaining body awareness while practicing so many repetitive sounding exercises? Wow. Um, so I think it's a matter of, again, mind over matter kind of things. Um, so that one's always aware, totally aware of, uh, you know, as you're repeating something, that you don't repeat it ad infinitum ad nauseum. That's, that's not really a helpful, I mean, that rote kind of practicing thing has its place and it can be useful. But I think there are more sophisticated ways of practicing. And um, if you're using the rote thing, let's say some of those exercises, you don't go on forever doing it. You know, don't, don't spend a half an hour doing a Kosman exercise. Um, and especially if you're building up the endurance. By the way, endurance is another thing I would have talked about if we had a little bit more time today. Uh, that, that's an important thing to be actually practicing for um, because when you're playing uh, a recital, you have to have the endurance to be able to play for, you know, 90 minutes or uh, whatever the length of the recital is. And one has to actually practice for that kind of thing. So I remember when I did the, um, I was working on the Bach Six Suite with Greenhouse and uh, I was getting close to the recital. He had me play the entire suite through, all repeats. He sat there, he listened. And at the end, uh, you know, I was expecting all kinds of comments. And at the end, he looked at me and said, mm -hmm. 
Now play it again. And he made me play the entire suite, all repeats, one more time. And it was one of the best lessons I've ever had, just in terms of my understanding of what's necessary to be able to play a huge program uh, that, that might involve that. Um, so one has to actually practice that way. Um, and the way you practice is the way you perform. So uh, one has to practice without, um, without uh, interruptions of a performance piece, what I call a playthrough of a piece, uh, even with some mistakes, so that you learn how to, how to make the corrections um, as, you're, as you're going. That was a long answer to a question that probably had nothing to do with that, but anyway. Great. And Michelle asks, uh, she's wondering if you had any postural such technique exercises that could help with thumb position and increase mobility in the higher positions on the cello. Um, say the first part of that question again. I didn't quite hear. Uh, if you had any postural slash technique postural. exercises. Okay. Postural. Okay. So that's again, a, you know, a huge topic. Um, when, when I do thumb position scales with students, um, I start with the one octave scales and um, uh, just doing scales and arpeggios from the foyer, uh, so you can look up what they what they have there. But the first thing to figure out is th how the hand should be shaped in thumb position. And so there are a couple of things that one uh, wants to look for. What I call the innie and the outie. The innie is this joint here, the outie is that joint. So for strength, I don't know if you can see this well, but for strength, you want to be like this. It's exactly the opposite of what you want down here, because down there you want the thumb to be round, but on thumb position, you want it to be this way. So um, uh, I would be working especially on developing the muscles to be able to do that and stabilize it, because that's the most stable way. Now, thumbs are really different on different people. So this is a vast generalization, but it does go, I would say 90% of the people of people can have that kind of a shape for the thumb. There are some people with very long first flange, um, some thinner bone, and so there's some other options on doing this, but that's the first place. The second thing is what I call the C shape. Uh, again, I don't know if you can see this, but that this is like in the shape of a C. So that when there's, the, this is not really low like that, where you can't move your fingers very well, it, there, uh, there's a shape here that allows you, enables you to be able to articulate from these joints. Um, so those are the first things. And then just getting used to it through some road, obviously it does need to have a certain amount of road to be able to learn those shapes. Another really important thing for thumb position is making sure that the elbow is in the right place. Cause a lot of people try to play thumb position back like this. Again, there's a lot of tension there and I can feel my muscles tightening up as I'm doing this. And if I'm around and at first that takes a little bit of getting used to, you know, how that feels with your shoulder forward a little bit like that, but it enables me to go up all the way to the top of the fingerboard. If I'm like this and trying to get it, I'll never make it or it's very, very tense. You can feel the difference if you if you just try. So those physical kinds of things. Uh, and just one other thing um, I would have mentioned again, if, if we had a little bit more time in the presentation, um, what I call isometrics are really good for establishing this innie and outie and this C shape. Isometrics are a muscle group against another muscle group. So when I was a kid, we didn't have all kinds of fancy equipment in gym class. They lined us up against the wall and had us push against the wall. And that was our muscle training. That's called isometrics, muscle group against inanimate object. We can do that very well, very easily with, um, with our, our various fingers, just pushing one finger against the other, five seconds, shake it out, don't do more than five seconds, but do it many times during the day. So if you have, for example, a lot of people are weak on this joint here, you just do this for, you know, 50 times a day. You can do it on the top of the cello. You can do it at the breakfast table, you know, pushing down on the table, um, all kinds of possibilities for those kind of isometric exercises. Within a week or two weeks, uh, the fingers get really strong from this and uh, you can train them in the way, like training Ivy, you can train them in the way you want the fingers to go. So for thumb position, that's the kind of stuff that I would suggest. And Joanna asks, what is the right height chair? <laughs> Great question. Boy, when I started teaching 50 years ago, in, I would go out to the public schools and they didn't have good cello chairs. Um, they had re these really low kind of metal chairs and things a lot of times. And so the cellists, were, let me, I'm sitting in a wrong kind of chair, by the way, for this presentation, I needed to be able to move forward and back. So I'm on a, a rolling chair. I have my cello chair right here. Um, and um, let's see, I don't know if you can hear me from this far back, but 
Um, what you want, what you're looking for in the height of the chair is the height of this part of the leg so that this leg is parallel to the floor. If anything, I would rather be a little bit on the higher side, so, um, so that, uh, but I don't want my feet to be back like this, and that's what happens if the chair is too low. And so a lot of, you know, you'll see people sitting in orchestra with this kind of position, uh, and it's not balanced. We'll talk first about balance. This enables balance. Um, and you want to be able to be in a place where you can easily just get up in that way and not, um, not have to kind of push yourself off in that way. Um, and one thing to, uh, to, uh, to be aware of as you grow, the cello has to grow too. So if you're, you know, in uh, a 13-year-old uh, kid who's starting to play and you have the cello at a certain, you have the end pin at a certain height, you get used to pulling out the end pin to that height. But if as you grow, the cello has to kind of grow up with you, which means, of course, pulling out the end pin a little bit further. Um, so, and conversely, I'm now at an age where I'm shrinking a little bit. Uh, I used to be right above six feet, and now I'm just down a little bit. So I'm having to readjust a little bit my cello and figure out, you know, exactly the best way. And I'm sure as I, as, as I get older, I'm going to be having it a little bit uh, lower. But what I'm looking for is that the legs are parallel. Uh, this, this part of the leg is parallel to the floor, that my legs are straight down in a balanced way so I can do the left right motion and that the cello the lower bow is touching the leg in this in this place here so that I can do this left right motion with the cello sliding so it doesn't get caught in the uh, corner of the cello there but that it's able to I'm able to to freely move for the left right motion in that, in that direction so another long answer for a question hopefully it address what you're looking for and then we have a couple of people asking about mental practice and if you can expand on that. Oh, so important, mental practice. Um, what I call often mentalizing, it's not a real word, word but I'll tell my students to, to just mentalize this passage for, uh, for a couple of seconds and then play it from memory. And it's amazing you know, how trainable our brains are. And when I watch kids who come in who've never memorized something before and all of a sudden they're, they're memorizing concertos and things very easily, um, a lot of it is based really on the training of scales and arpeggios because all of our music is composed of scales and arpeggios. And as much as some people dislike practicing scales and arpeggios, well, that's the reason our book is going to have all these drones and make it hopefully more enjoyable to practice scales and, and arpeggios. But you, they have to be internalized, memorized, um, and that takes a little bit of work. So going through the two octave scales and arpeggios in the foyer is the number one thing to do because those are the patterns that one has to learn to be able to then sight read easily and to be able to know the geography of the cello really well. That's the starting place. You know, 60%, 70% of our playing is in neck positions. And so many people just are not familiar enough with how and you know the geography of neck positions and how extensions work and knowing where they are, knowing the names of the notes, knowing the chords, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the starting place is foyer, um, two octave scale and arpeggios, if you can find that in the foyer book. And then um, I realized at some point when I was in Freiburg and I was a student, uh, I was teaching in Viola Marine, which is um, just, uh, just north of Basel, um, about 45 minutes or 40 minutes away from Freiburg and I would go on the train and I would really resent the time that I was taken away from my practicing to be on the train to go to Weil am Rhein to teach. And, but I, I said, well, I'll take along my Bach or whatever I was working on. And in the train, I would just kind of study it and think about it and actually, you know, mentalize, as I said, what I was, what I was doing. And I realized when I got back, I had learned <laughs> an entire movement without even having practiced. I'd, I'd learned, I mean, I had obviously been practicing before, but I learned to memorize during that use of the time just completely away from the cello. And it was really instructive to me to how much mind over matter, how much you're able to do um, without actually playing. And again, you don't play out of tune <laughs> when you're mentalizing in that way, but it is training the brain and you're having to do it very slowly and think all the notes and think the positions and train in the bowing, but you can do that not even making a movement, just absolutely silently studying the score, studying the, the part. So uh, I find that very important and I emphasize it a lot in my students. 
then Anton is asking about getting tired in the right arm very quickly, particularly when playing on the A string. Uh, he's tried changing the cello's angle and also not tensing his arm, but it's still an issue. Well, um, you know, I'd have to see, uh, what was the name? I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Uh, Anton. Anton. I'd have to see Anton play to really know what the problems are. But um, I would. my first question would be, are you using left-right motion? Are you using this choreography that... Are you using the arm in the right way? Are you, do you realize that from the frog to the middle is controlled by the upper arm? Middle to the tip is controlled by the lower arm. And that when you're using the full bow with the left right motion, you want to get this sort of choreography again into your system. Um, I'd have to see to know because everybody's issues are a little bit different, but there are some of those kinds of things that I'm just always amazed that if I ask the question, so, um, you know, which part of the arm, you know, so you're playing here, which part of the arm is moving, you know, and people sort of look and they go, they don't really know what they're doing as far as which part of the arm should be doing what in, in the playing. Um, very, <laughs> uh, uh, there's too much to, to, to for, for an answer for this kind of a question, I'd really have to see him play. All right, and then Ethan asks uh, if you think strength training at the gym is helpful for longevity of playing the cello. Strength training? Yes. You know, I think strength training is is uh, sort of overrated. You don't need big muscles to play. Um, uh, what you need, the best kind of exercise, Paul Katz used to say, I studied with Paul uh, at Eastman many years ago, and, and he used to say that aerobic exercise and swimming is the best. He encouraged everybody to go to do all kinds of aerobic kinds of exercises. It's less about strength. It's not big muscles. It's um, really using the body efficiently and effectively. Um, I had a friend... Uh, in Freiburg named Akiko Kanemaru. Some of you may recognize her name. She was the principal cellist of the uh, Zurich Tonkutsu Orchestra. Uh, and she was, uh, she was Japanese and she was pretty small, <laughs> for quite small and had very small fingers and hands. But she, her mom wanted her to be a cellist from age zero up. So she would uh, sit in the bathtub when she was a little, tiny little girl and her mother would stretch her fingers like this and just work on the flexibility, just, you know, massage them. And, and Akiko had the most flexible technique I had ever seen. She could play so fast and so accurately. And she studied with, um, with Tautelier. And uh, so there was, uh, Akiko, she was, she used the talk, pick Tautelier. She used the cello was quite high with a bent end pin. Uh, probably not the most appropriate way of, for, for somebody so small because the pictorial is really meant for people with long arms. But anyway, she would sit there and play and her tiny little head, you know, behind the cello there. But it was the most unbelievable technique as far as flexibility and um, also expression. She was beautifully beautiful cellist. Um, so again, it's not strength. She was not muscular at all, but she was very flexible. Anton asks another question, any advice to strengthen the skin of the thumb in thumb position? You know, the skin is really different on different people. And um, that's always sort of interesting to watch how that develops as people are practicing. Thumb position, I have, uh, you probably can't see it, but I have a big bump there. And um, even though I went for like, whatever, seven months or something, not having been able to practice because of my shoulder issue um, uh, from the fall, uh, I wasn't able to have that, that thumb position uh, callus has stayed there because it was built up over decades. And so it's it's still there. I mean, I'm practicing again now, thumb position, and I'm able, able to do it, and it's building up again, but it, it never really left. And so it didn't really hurt coming back. Uh, some of the other left-hand finger uh, calluses did actually kind of um, disappear a little bit more. Um, so they're they're gradually coming back now also. Um, as far as the thumb, so Tautelier had a nice exercise um, where he would, you can look in Tautelier's book, he, it's something where he goes, be da di ba da di da di and it would just kind of move up and down with the thumb like that. And um, that was a good way of kind of, you know, working on that callus there. Um, another one is just moving up and down the string like this and doing a little bit of that. I wouldn't do a lot of it. You don't want to burn a hole in the finger there. Um, but just a little bit every day, rubbing a little bit and giving it uh, a little bit of time, it'll build up the callus. But some people just don't ever really get that calloused in their fingers. Uh, maybe they're not callous people, which is a good thing. Uh, but their fingers um, maybe don't get quite, so it depends on the kind of skin one has. 
Great. And then we're just going to jump to a couple of in the practice room questions, uh, starting with uh, what is the first thing you do on the cello every day out of all those exercises that you shared with us today? I almost always start with open strings and actually my students too. I'll, I'll ask them to play open strings because there's so many ways of playing open strings. And again, just listening to the sound, um, how you're used to just making sure you're, you're checking in and making sure the bow is at perpendicular perpendicular uh, parallel to the bridge and so forth. Um, you know, that's one of those things that's not the most natural because the way the arm swings, um, the upper arm. So one has to, that's a training thing. One has to learn how to to move the arm in space. It's another thing you can do, proprioception, knowing where your arm has to be when you're on the A string, let's say, at the tip and where your arm has to be on the C string. And you should know that without even having the cello or a bow in the hand, you should, this is where it is. I can take the cello right now, take my bow, and that's where it'll be, to be on the A string um, at the tip. Um, so, uh, I already forgot the question. <laughs> so, yeah, just open strings. I, I start almost every day with a couple of minutes of open strings, listening to the sound, listening to the resonance, listening to the core sound, training again. Uh, for my students, it's really important training that concept of core sound close to the bridge slow bow and um realizing again that that's not the sound that's most beautiful under your ear but it's a sound that'll project in a hole so that's what i that's what i start with and then i have a whole as i started today's presentation a whole you know a hundred of these uh exercises that are that are good for warm-up kind of things and do a couple of minutes of that how do you cultivate inspiration in the practice room what motivates you? Oh, wow. You know, that for me, that's just never been a problem. Um, I love practicing, actually, <laughs> as strange as it sounds. Um, and one has to make one's peace with it if you don't love practicing, because if you're going to make progress on the instrument, whether you're professional or not, you have to um, you have to love being by yourself in a room. And by the way, if you're not going to be a musician, that's one of the things that uh, business people um, love about cellists and about musicians in general. They know how to work by themselves uh, on a project and just, um, you know, assigned a project and they can take it and run with it. So um, uh, I've had a number of students who go on and become uh, all different kinds of careers. Uh, but it's one of the things that people uh, love about, about us, that we know how to do this. Um, obviously, if one has projects that you're working on and goals, a recital is the best. You know, if there's a, a recital coming up, you're going to practice for that recital really well. But I think um, the larger thing is to try to figure out how to make it fun to and how to want to do it. So, um, but I have to say for me, that's that's not been a problem. I'm very consistent about practicing. And I love the kind of self-discipline. By the way, the self-discipline I learned from practicing for years and years and years has helped me tremendously with this shoulder in injury. And the PT people that I go to, they're, they're just amazed that I, how disciplined I am about doing these exercises every day, all 26 or seven of these exercises, and the progress that I've made as a result of that. Um, and I had a student many years ago who, she was, um, I don't know, maybe, 11 or 12 and by the time she became about 15 or something she developed um, diabetes and she needed to give herself insulin and so forth and when she graduated high school her doctor said to her she she was the most amazing patient he ever had that she um, always uh, was able to deal with the problem and give the insulin and so forth never failing and very self-disciplined. And she said to me that, she told me this, uh, that the doctor had said that, and she said it was because of her self-discipline that she learned in playing the cello. You know, that every day you're gonna do your scales and arpeggios, you're gonna do your exercises, you're gonna do your etudes, um, you're gonna do, and that it's a routine. And um, you train this kind of self-discipline. Our society nowadays is very undisciplined. Um, and it's, uh, we don't put high marks on that in some way, but for musicians, that's important. And uh, the training that one gets from that can be serve one for, for life, lifetime. How do you go about deepening your musical imagination? Deepening musical imagination. I always, when I was a student in Freiburg again, I, I figured out a lot of stuff about practicing as when I was a student. My teacher talked a lot about it and so forth. But one of the things I figured out was that um, I had to get up really early in the morning to um, 
uh, to sign out the practice room for the next day. Because if I didn't get up and uh, get there by seven o'clock, then all of the Chinese and Japanese and Korean students would have signed out for the next day, all the practice rooms. So I had to get there by seven o'clock. And I realized then, okay, I'm going to start the day with just the most basic things and just uh, almost routine kind of things and not having to think a lot. I'm still sleeping. I'm not a morning person at all. And so, uh, and then I would, have, so I do an hour of that and then I would go have, have uh, some coffee and brunch. And, um, but conversely, the best practice time for creative practicing for me is late at night. I'm, an, I'm a night practicer and a night, uh, I'm a late night kind of person. <coughs> and I found that what I call discovery practice, uh, creative practice, that happens a lot of times for me really late at night. Um, when I can, like I've done everything I need to do practice wise, and I just try a passage and, oh, let's try this fingering. Oh, let's see this bowing. Let's see how this will work. And that's where I discover a lot of things. Um, and the other part of creative kind of thinking <coughs> for me comes in my teaching that in order to solve a problem for a particular student, I have to quickly think, okay, how, what's the best way to solve it? And so I'm constantly coming up with new little exercises that are tailored for this particular person. So I have, I name them, name the exercises after these people because this exercise came from that person. And so I'm gonna call it that, that person's name. And um, that, so that's kind of also a, a creativity in, um, in my own thinking about playing the cello, that sort of thing. In your mind, what is it that makes an effective practice session? I think th that I want to be able to come out of 20 minutes of practicing having accomplished something. If, um, if I can't say to myself in a few minutes time, and I would say, you know, a, a general good amount of time for this kind of stuff is 20 minutes. Um, if I can't stop and go, okay, yeah, I couldn't do this particular coordination thing before. I couldn't do this fingering thing before. I um, figured out the intonation on this particular thing. I figured out the sound, whatever. Um, that I have to be able to really say, uh, you know, this, I accomplished this in a short period of time, not two hours, but a short period of time. Sometimes much less than that. And for my students, um, I'll ask them, so what did you accomplish? You know, after a few minutes, I'll say, what did you accomplish here? Or what did you accomplish at the end of the lesson, uh, by the end of the lesson? And I hope that they're able to tell me back what it was that they kind of learned. And um, that, that tells me then that they're set up for being able to practice the next day using those techniques and things. Great. I think that marks the end of the questions. Okay. Uh, if you can give any closing remarks, that would be great. And I will let you know once the live broadcast has concluded. Well, I uh, thank you all for, for being there. And um, as I mentioned early on, if you want to get this PowerPoint that I had, uh, if any of those exercises are of interest, you can email me. Um, and um, I hope that you all have as much pleasure and joy from this wonderful thing, the cello that we have um, that's so unique and so special. And I hope you all have as much joy in that, in not only performing, but in learning and practicing and focusing and all the aspects of, uh, of, of just playing the cello and the wonderful repertoire, the wonderful music that we're able to enter into as a result of it. So I thank you all for being there and I say goodbye.